All right, thank you all for joining us today. Um, on behalf of the Seeger Center for Asian Studies uh, at Atlanta School of International Affairs, my name is Robert Shepard. And um, this talk is a part of a continuing series, the Seeger Center Lecture Series. And uh, we're very happy to be joined today by two eminent scholars who have spent many years looking at environmental issues in the People's Republic uh, of China. Um, I'm not going to, you didn't come to hear me speak. You came to hear Dr. Shapiro and Dr. Turner. So I'm not going to read their bi in, uh, their bios. Um, you, you have access to that. Um, our format today, um, we're going to begin. Dr. Shapiro will take 15 minutes to speak, after which Dr. Turner will take 15 minutes to speak, and that will leave about 45 minutes for some robust um, dialogue and, and Q&A. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Dr. Judy Shapiro of the American University here in Washington, D.C. Yeah, so hi, um, and thank you, Bob, and thank you, Miriam, in the background for inviting me and for allowing me to share the stage with my favorite co co colleague, Jennifer Turner. <laughs> so, um, so I prepared uh, a presentation for you, and then I almost feel like I should throw it out because today is this climate summit and could be an historic climate summit. Hopefully it won't be like a Copenhagen climate summit where, you know, people are very disappointed. So I'm sure that in the Q&A we'll be addressing some of these questions, but I was just wanted to throw out some of the questions that are on my mind and then we can talk about them um, later <laughs> after I do my other presentation. So one is um, the question of whether, given the enormous number of conflicts between the U.S. and China, whether they can successfully bracket off the climate change issue from these other issues and not use them to, to leverage um, problems of Xinjiang or Hong Kong or um, the South China Sea, or et cetera, et cetera. Another question is how the two countries will deal with their problems domestically. How quickly is China going to be able to reduce its coal consumption? Xi Jinping apparently this morning didn't make any new commitments, but he did say something about reducing coal. Um, and we also wonder how Biden is going to deal with all of the Republican opposition and the climate deniers and um, how he's going to achieve this tremendous um, transformation of the U.S. economy. Um, I wonder whether climate change could serve as a wedge, a sort of environmental peacemaking wedge, as a way to get the two countries to start talking with each other again, not only, um, you know, Beijing to Washington, but also all the academics and the scholars and the people-to-people -people exchanges that in so many ways have been broken um, because of Trump's sort of anti, like, China-phobic um, sort of policies. And then I also wonder if, if Biden is going to be able to reclaim U.S. credibility on this issue. Um, I wonder if China's commitment to ecological civilization is for real. Um, and I also wonder if um, China will do as it claims and green the Belt and Road Initiative, you know. So these are things I think we really do need to talk about. But now we're going to talk about my other presentation. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, and ideally, I'm going to find my my presentation. There we go. Oopsie, I'm sorry, this is a different presentation. This is a presentation that I'm making on Monday to Coimbra. Sorry, try sharing the screen. You know what? You're going to get the Coimbra presentation. I don't care. We're going to get the Coimbra presentation or parts of it. So, um, the Coimbra presentation. Um, um, I wrote a book together with a, a colleague named Yifei Li in NYU, at NYU Shanghai. And in this presentation, we in this book, we explore the idea of whether 
China is actually achieving um, its green goals or whether it's using its green goals to achieve a different kind of um, authoritarianism. So to start, I like to establish my bona fides. So if I turn to one side, you can see that's me um, as a young girl um, in um, China in 1979, teaching English in Hunan, Changsha. Now, ecological civilization, we hear about Xi Jinping talking about clear waters and green mountains being gold mountains and silver mountains. You know, some people have said this is a kind of, um, I don't know, it's putting a dollar figure on the environment. But in any case, this um, phrase ecological civilization is in the Chinese um, constitution now. Um, so this seems to be very exciting. And in our frustration um, to see the messy democratic processes of not being up to dealing with the climate, with the planet's um, environmental problems, we often think, oh, well, maybe the answer is a green dictator. You know, maybe what we need is this. So the book that she, that uh, Ife Lee and I wrote together is to, intended to explore that. Um, so here's some more images of um, ecological civilization. Um, now, just to baseline, we know that China's environment is really terrible. Um, there's lots of environmental accidents. There's um, all different kinds of terrible images. But we often have to think about China as actually be, being um, the locus of, of pollution that the developed world has displaced onto China. And so here's a very famous image of Guiyu, um, the e-waste trade, which of course China has very recently decided to stop. And I think Jennifer may be talking about that a bit later. Um, so look at all this plastic that's all going to China. Again, Jennifer's gonna talk about this in a little bit. But this is the table of contents of the new book. And in the new book, we uh, try to uh, identify certain kinds of tools that the Chinese Communist Party tends to use in order to achieve environmental goals. And we discovered that although there are many successes, more often than not, it's very top-down, very um, mechanistic, it's very technocratic, and it doesn't often involve public participation. And we found that when public participation is involved, that's when you get success. So um, here's an example of the campaign style, you know, Sometimes um, when there's uh, the Olympics, the 2008 Olympics are coming along, China's determined, Beijing is determined to make the skies blue. They have a campaign, shut down all the factories, tell people they can't drive their cars. And you know, this is a little memory of what the sky looks like when it's blue. And of course the ordinary people say, well, they care more about foreign dignitaries than they care about us. You know, So this is, uh, to me, a funny picture. Um, similarly with the Shanghai, um, the rollout of the Shanghai recycling policy has been um, quite sort of draconian and sudden. And it's even come to the point that you have local people inspecting your trash. And if you don't do it correctly, it could hurt your social credit score. And at the same time, we've lost some of this informal economy of the flatbed truck recyclers. Um, so this um, quantitative um, approach, don't worry, I'm not gonna read any of this, but imagine yourself to be an ordinary um, official trying to achieve this target, um, all of these targets, and if you don't achieve them well, you're gonna end up without a promotion. Um, and so um, what we, one of my favorite illustrations of how this can go awry is a couple summers ago in Henan province, they found that whenever the farmers um, use their threshing machines, um, it artificially spiked the pollution. And so the local officials said no threshing machines this summer and all the farmers were unable to bring in their grain and the grain um, harvest was lost. So um, yeah, I'm gonna move through these because the Quimber talk is an hour long and this is not what we're doing here but um, come to Quimbra on Monday if you're interested. All right, so for us, I wanted to think about the rise of China and the easy and the impact on the environment. And it's not only about climate change. I think we can divide it into three baskets. So um, on the one hand, the rise of the Chinese middle class has meant that, they, that people can afford to buy endangered species that are used in traditional Chinese medicine in a way that they weren't able to afford it before. And so this has tremendous impact on all of these populations, particularly you know, the pandas and the elephants. And of course, it also promotes the potential 
for zoonotic diseases to jump from, whether it's pangolins or bats, or, you know, we don't really know yet, but um, this kind of close association between wildlife and people is very dangerous. Um, the second basket, we can think about um, resource extraction in general. Um, the, David Harvey, this left-wing um, thinker, talks about the second contradiction of capitalism, and that's, you know, basically in China, they're already running out of some of these raw materials and they're so capitalistic, they need growth. So they're running out of raw materials, they have to get those raw materials from overseas, and they also have to look for new markets. Capitalism demands new markets. You know, so we can understand sometimes what's going on with the go going out policy and the Belt and Road Initiative in terms of this second contradiction of capitalism. And finally, we can talk specifically about the BRI, although that means everything to everyone, right? And it's you know, everything from Djibouti to the Space Belt and Road and the Dairy Belt and Road and the Outer Space Belt and Road, you know. But anyway, basically, it's it's big infrastructure like ports, dams, pipelines, roads and railroads, power plants, and these fragment landscapes transform habitats, affect biodiversity and human livelihoods, and increase fossil fuel emissions. So just a couple of illustrations for these. I guess many of you know who this is. Not the elephant. I don't know that. I never met the elephant, but I never met Yao Ming either. But um, Yao Ming has been a wonderful citizen celebrity and lent his name and image to the efforts of Wild Aid, the NGO, to I see you, Bob, five minutes um, um, to try to uh, curb the consumption of shark fin and also the consumption of elephant ivory. Here, this is a bit of China pro Chinese propaganda to. Um, talk about this resources extraction being a win-win green development solution for, you know, happy Africans, happy Chinese. And of course, the reality on the ground is often very different. Um, generally speaking, Chinese investors are not very skilled or used to consulting with local communities. And they'll often tend to pair up with some sort of strongman or authoritarian government. And then they'll be super surprised when the local community isn't happy about um, a project. Um, so much so that actually, I don't know if you saw the news, but Australia, which is not a developing country, but Australia has just today or yesterday um, canceled its Belt and Road um, contracts with China. Um, so this was the original proposed routes of the Belt and Road, but in fact, the Belt and Road, you know, as you can see from the map, it's pretty much everywhere um, and everything. There's a certain deliberate vagueness um, about what is the Belt and Road, which is um, kind of handy for the Chinese government. Little Belt and Road, uh, you know, fireworks. Um, so this is for Coimbra, and uh, this Jennifer, this is for you. <laughs> okay, this is they said no to the waste, and um, Jennifer's going to talk about this. Um, so this is just really super fascinating to me. Um, that sometimes when we talk, let's go back to the climate change conversation just briefly here. Often um, my students ask, um, I'm going to, can I do my term paper on the Chinese climate movement. And I said, well, you know, actually, no, there isn't so much a Chinese grassroots movement. Ordinary Chinese people are much more concerned about the, the contamination of their food, the fact that their air is so hard to breathe, that there's, you know, toxic heavy metals in the water. The Chinese government, I submit to you, is made up of people who are trained often as scientists and engineers. There's no question that in the Chinese policymaking world, Climate change is real, it's coming, and it's a serious security threat. So in order to deal with gla glacier melt in the Tibetan Plateau, glacier melt will cause short-term flooding and long-term aquifer dropping. Um, they've actually started to do this campaign of putting silver iodide shooting machines all over the Tibetan Plateau, which then bind with the water that comes up from India and the monsoons and makes it rain and theoretically replenishes glaciers. So this is a kind of a massive geoengineering experiment. It's like what we saw with the Blue Sky campaign, except those are very short-lived. This is a permanent effort to change the weather. So quite interesting. And again, it underlines this technocratic approach. Um, so sorry that this is for Quimbra. So I, I made the I made the time, Bob. So what Ife and I discovered was that you know we started out to talk about or to explore authoritarian environmentalism, but we found out that more often than not, these policies wrap in a cloak of green the authoritarian goals of the state. And so it's really more often environmental authoritarianism rather than authoritarian environmentalism, if you follow me. 
Um, so I'm gonna just skip through that and give you a nice thank you. Um, when the pandemic is over, we in, in DC will be able to go to the zoo and um, visit with Xiao, Xiao Qi Ji, who can stand on his head. Anyway, that's my thought for today. And um, thank you again, Bob, turning it over to Jennifer. Thank you so much, Judy. And now uh, we're gonna turn to uh, Dr. Turner from the Wilson Center for 15 minutes. Yes, and I know that I, I have the power being a presenter, so I, I won't go too crazy on you guys on this one. So um, yeah, hi, and you know, Judith, I I think I'm gonna have to find a fun um, Changsha photo because I started my time in China in also in Changsha. <clears throat> and I don't have anyone braiding my hair, but I do have a picture of me te playing teaching my university students how to play baseball with a broomstick. So maybe I could toss that picture in to show that I too hung out in Hunan um, in 1987 as a Yingyu Laosha, an English teacher. All right, building on Judah's talk, we're going to, um, my theme here is like, China is the world's not always so green leader. Um, you may remember that um, when the Trump uh, came into office that one of the first, actually I think the first thing he did was, was pull us out of the Paris Climate Agreement, and now of course Biden put us back in, and Right after that, we started seeing lots of, of, of situations where President Xi Jinping would, would, was giving talks and kind of comforting the global community, like, don't worry, China's here, we're going to be, we're the leader, the green leader. And, and he wasn't just, you know, making this up completely. I mean, under the Obama administration, you know, I've been, I have had a front row seat for 21 years at the Wilson Center, uh, looking at government, NGO, business, and researchers in both countries and Europe and everywhere, working in China and energy and environment. And it was so striking to me that during the Obama administration, I mean, they, they came up with nine clean energy agreements with China, so much interaction. It was kind of like cooperative competitors because this is something from 2016 where, you know, that kind of, because they've been having exchanges and they had a renewable energy working group. And you saw that in one year, the U.S. installed 40 gigawatts of solar panels, and of course, China did twice as many. But notice in the bottom right corner, in some Chinese provinces, up to like 30 percent of the electricity from solar didn't make it on the grid. Similar story with wind. So we had garbage wind, garbage solar panels. And this kind of uh, it illustrates some things that, that, that Judith was talking about, that in China, the, the Communist Party government says, we're going to do solar, and they gave subsidies to all these uh, state-owned enterprises, and suddenly you had wind farms built and solar farms built all over the place, but they were built before the grid had reached the area. Um, in the interim, more and more of these solar and wind farms have been put on the grid. Uh, now they're kind of trying to work more on getting more, more uh, storage batteries. So, but there, there's oftentimes there's this aggressive implementation, but a little slippage in the final results. Um, but also during that time, um, I mean, even before, but particularly during the Obama administration, there was a lot of um, joint work on, on green cities, low carbon, um, energy efficient buildings. In fact, I'm having a meeting on Monday, bringing some Chinese and US folks talking about um, the building sector is one of the largest uh, sources of energy consumption in the world, energy and transportation. And those are two sectors where US and Chinese experts, and it's not just the government, NGOs like World Resource Institutes, uh, Natural Resources Defense Council, they've been working with Chinese researchers and policymakers to kind of help get the policies right. So besides kind of energy efficiency, one of my favorite, this is really, a, well, the U.S. does it too, but the Chinese have a better name, Sponge City uh, campaign, which now is more of a policy, which is China, China has a big problem with so much cement that there's a lot of flooding and they're trying to capture the stormwater because it's, it's highly destructive. And so they're building more, more gardens, finding ways to absorb it, very innovative, a lot of attention to it. So there's, there's really been a lot going on in China in terms of the green cities. Now, another reason why Xi Jinping may have felt that, you know, that, and, you know, that he is the world's green leader is that, well, you know, last year he just decided that China was going to just turn away or drive away um, from internal combustion engines. So they're going to require electric vehicles. Um, so a lot of them, and they're doing this for both kind of the blue sky defense, I mean, great slogans here, oil security, but also global market opportunities. And this has been a game changer because once China made that decision, 
you start seeing more and more companies around the world making announcements around electric vehicles. And just as a quick side note, I mean, in some ways, this policy and some of China, you know, their zero emission type policies is really copying a lot of what goes on in California. So just think of China as, a, in some ways, a supersized California in terms of their policies. Implementation can, you know, not always make it. Now, another reason why Xi Jinping you know, could very well could, you know, was I think fairly justified that you know, saying that you know China is the world leader in terms of climate, but that even during the Trump administration, I mean, China you know, was. They had been doing a lot, still continuing their efforts to decrease their dependence on coal, increase the renewables. And we have, I mean, we haven't been there recently, Judith, but we do know from our friends that we are seeing more blue skies in China. But the point I want to, to emphasize here, and we could talk more in the Q&A, is that Xi Jinping said today in his talk at the Biden Leaders Summit, Climate Summit, that China will meet their, their Paris targets, you know, commitment by 2030. Most energy experts say that China already did cap their coal. They, they reached their, the level they were supposed to in 2015, but they're not owning either. That's not a formal acceptance of it. And a little bit disappointing was that last year, um, we started seeing more provinces restart building coal-fired power plants, even though existing coal-fired power plants are only being used about 50%, but it's to create jobs. So it's kind of a concerning trend. Um, and then, of course, as Judith mentioned, that that um, that China's overseas about 80% of their energy investments overseas under the Belt and Road have been coal and oil. And some experts say that you know if you count that, that nullifies China's own progress. But keep in mind the countries where they're investing. I mean, like Pakistan, for instance, there's like 33% of the population doesn't have electricity, and so they need power. But it's the question. But the big challenge is like, well, well, China's number one on wind and solar, and they're doing a lot on energy efficiency. How do we get those things on the Dalton Road? All right. So right now, I just want you to kind of think, you know, you might have heard that just last week there was a joint statement, a U.S.-China statement on the climate crisis. Um, don't know if, if, if this will really be the, the, the year of the, the carbon neutral ox between the U.S. and China that we're going to come back together. I think we probably will see more multilateral cooperation, but at least everyone's still in the room. Now, while the, the climate issue may seem kind of like the good, the bad, and the ugly, unsure where it's going, I wanted to share just a couple things that, that are kind of good news environmental stories. China has, you know, as their economies have been developing, they've been drowning in waste. I mean, they produce twice as much municipal waste as we do, and even, even more. And a lot of it, like in the US, was more single use plastics. Um, China had been importing about 50% for like 40 years, 50% of the world's plastic waste that was, that was being traded to be a feedstock for industry. But they started then having more of their own plastic waste. So a little over a year ago, China just said, no. We're, we're, they pulled out what they called the green sword. Really, Judith, don't they have the best slogans? <laughs> so they pulled out their green sword and they said, we're not taking plastic, single use plastics anymore. And that was truly a game changer. Now, a lot of US and other countries started trying to ship it to Southeast Asia and Southeast Asian countries are now like, no, nope, we don't want your single use plastics. So we're starting to see some real rethinking um, in the US and Europe and Australia about we have to deal with our own waste. Um, within China, there, there, the policies on, uh, there were the draconian sorting policies that Judith talked about. But they, but they really are trying to find a way to increase collection, sorting, recycling. Um, they have bans on single, certain single-use plastics. Um, also trying to put pressure on the e-commerce industry to reduce their plastic. So there's a lot of top-down, but I want to highlight that there was actually some, I don't know why things doing this, um, that, that some Chinese NGOs brought a public interest lawsuit against food delivery companies. Just one company, Meituan, their plastic bags in one day could cover 168 soccer fields, right? Big plastic problem in China. And so you have bottom up efforts to try to pressure companies to do something about that as well. And also we can talk more in the Q&A. There's been kind of a, a, a the political space and elbow room for Chinese environmental NGOs has been shrinking again, but it has been a, for many years has been a, an area, a kind of a good news area like Ma Jun. He still um, has his online 
pollution databases and has been really pushing hard for pollution information transparency, working with Chinese and international companies. So I want to make sure that when, when you leave today's talk that you don't think it's all gloom and doom. But now to a gloom and doomy topic, but or a mixed topic. Um, switching to fish, am I doing okay, Bob? I'm just going to give one final story. Five minutes, we're perfect here. Five fish in five minutes. So China's the number one fish consumer, producer, and exporter in the world. Um, and the Chinese demand for fish cannot be met domestically. One reason is because water pollution in their coastal waters has killed most of the fisheries. So, and then they switch to more aquaculture. Um, but aquaculture alone also can't solve all of their problems. So they, they, they've increased their trade. I, a little slide that we made to kind of give you a sense that China's fish consumption and production is really, it's, it's global. Um, and, and that the United States, did you know that 85 to 90% of the seafood consumed in our country is imported? Even though we have these two big coasts, we actually increasingly have been sending our own fish catches to China to be processed into things and then sent back to us. It's, it's, it's a topic for a longer talk that I probably will be having more fish sessions at, at the Wilson Center, but getting you kind of thinking that how big this is. And China's aquaculture that about, just for example, Friday night fish fry, 73% of our tilapia comes from Chinese farms. So again, a lot of our fish is coming from China. Now, because they can't meet the fish needs domestically, from their own waters or their own aquaculture, um, and even some imports, they they have they have they have set up the world's largest distant water fishing fleet. And you say, Jennifer, how big is that? Well, let me tell you. They say that officially it's a little under three thousand offshore fishing vessels, but satellite data shows that it's a lot more. Um, and they're being driven by a lot of fuel subsidies. So can we talk climate, right? So a lot of oil, subsidies on oil in the shipping. To, to get these ships out to sea. Um, so they're the largest fleet of legal fishing and also the largest of illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. And that IUU fishing is about 20% of the world's catch in some areas. I think off of like Western Africa, it could be up to 50%. Um, and China is really driving this IUU fishing and just creating you know, global stocks to crash around the world. Give you a little squiddy story here to give you a little image that you have legal and illegal side by side. 85% of Peru's jumbo flying squid catches exported to China, to Asia, mainly China, but every year Chinese fleets are also illegally fishing out of Peru to get these, these lovely beasties. Um, and just a little map that my friends at China Dialogue let me put up here for you. The little black dots are Asian squid vessels that are just outside you know, they're just in international waters, right on the edge of where they could go in. And the little yellow dots are Peruvian artisanal vessels. So a lot of Chinese um, distant water fishing vessels will, will sneak in, take out. And so it's just, I just thought this was kind of an interesting kind of this little like battle line to catch the squid here. So, no. um, now China has been revising some of their fisheries law. They want to rein in the IUU fishing. They're also talking, there's a global port state measure initiative that China hasn't signed yet. It would be good to sign, but they won't sign it until they know they can enforce it. What is this? Port state measure agreement is that ports around the world are going to inspect fish that come to them um, to make sure that they were legal catches. And I think one of the biggest obstacles to, to really reining in China's illegal fishing is just the lack of transparency. It's very easy, um, but there's, um, there's a lot of global pressure coming on the Chinese on this, and you know we'll have to see if they'll come on board <laughs> and to legal fishing. So end up here with this lovely little electric vehicle um, police car in uh, in China, and just a little advertisement. Please feel welcome to join the China Environment Forum. My mafia can be your mafia, and uh, I'll sign off here so we can ask some questions. Okay. Thank you so much, Jennifer, and uh, thank you. Both Jennifer and Judy for being so rigorous with the with the uh, time limits. Uh, we have about forty five minutes exactly now for questions, and um, I failed to mention at the beginning of this uh, for the audience. If you have a question, the easiest way to ask this is to enter it in the chat box, and then we'll try to go through these in order. And uh, Dr. Turner and Dr. Shiro 
Shapiro agreed to limit their answers so we can try to get through as many questions as possible. That said, I'll, uh, the first question I'll pose, and this is more an open-ended one, I guess I'll start with Dr. Shapiro. Um, Judy, your thoughts on the future prospects of climate diplomacy? We, we saw it begin today and... Um, yeah. Well, I think we're really lucky in that um, John Kerry and Xie Zhenhua have known each other for a very, very long time. And anyone who has been involved with China understands the importance of personal relationships. So, you know, they're Lao Peng, you know, they're old friends, right? Even if they weren't friends, you know, they've been seeing each other in these meeting rooms, I don't know, maybe for decades even. And I believe, I don't have, you know, firm evidence, but I believe that as individuals, they both really care about climate change. So they are both faced with the problem of how to deal with these other forces on them, but they absolutely have a shared goal. So in that sense, I feel um, super optimistic. I mean, it's possible that they will have interference um, from different forces, but um, I think they're going to do the best. I, I couldn't put it in two, in, in four better hands. <laughs> Thank you. Jennifer, your well, thoughts on that? I mean, there are pressures too, um, you know, with even on the U.S. side, because we have a lot of very, you know, con, you know, a lot of issues concerning the U.S. about human rights in, in, in Xinjiang and, and the security, other, other security issues and trade. Um, and um, one of my friends, uh, one of my friends whose name I told totally face out right here, Scott Tong at Marketplace, he had this great line in an article he wrote for the Wilson Center that he said that, you know, he thinks that the U.S. and China, that we can argue and chew gum at the same time. That, that, that you know, while we have these differences, I mean, that, I mean, the environment, I mean, I think environment and climate have been really kind of part of the DNA of the U.S.-China relationship, that there's been, you know, things go, you know, off the rails many times over the decades since we, since we began formal relations, but scientific research. So it's kind of the science diplomacy, climate diplomacy. I don't think we're going to go back to, as I mentioned in my, in my comments, to this, this huge embrace that we had um, during, during the Obama administration, because in some ways, you know, China, you know, they've continued to develop. They, they he, you know, when she said he sees himself as a leader, I mean, they, they, they are doing the research. They're the number one investor in clean energy technologies. They see this as a way to grow the country in terms of clean tech. Um, but then you did see, if you heard, watch his comments today, that Xi Jinping seemed to be, I felt like I was going traveling back in time because he wasn't, he wasn't talking about him being elite, China being a leader. And the 14 five-year plan that he referenced, said, you know, well, we'll continue the decrease in coal. 14 five-year plan really was not ambitious. Um, I mean, China has already ostensibly met their Paris climate agreement. Leadership is when you go beyond it. And I think that, but now that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really much more of a global conversation. I think that's going to be help, help the U.S. and China, you know, we'll work together in a group, right? Because I think the, the bilateral is very sensitive. Um, yeah, I'll just keep it at that right now. But if you have any more detailed questions, I don't want to rattle. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, the next question is more, I guess, more about generational sociological question from the audience and has to do with do do and I, I guess I'll begin with uh, Jennifer this time the extent to which you see changes in attitudes among younger generations in China towards broad issues like environmental protection sustainability um, uh, also is there any evidence of any consumer pressure on corporations to be more environmentally uh, uh, aware in China? I mean, I think that there's some, and Julie, you, you can jump in on this as well. I mean, I think that, you know, on a lot of the big environmental issues, I mean, in China, you know, they do sometimes see that, you know, it's the government's job. Um, protests, we did see back in, you know, 2006, 7, 8, you know, and also up through the, the air apocalypse problems in the 2012, 2013, 2014, people did take to the streets protesting the air pollution and other environmental issues. And now you're not seeing those as much anymore. And, I, and I'm and not gonna say that people aren't, you know, maybe they're not so upset, but um, 
but what people do find opportunities to participate. My favorite example is when the ministries of um, housing and environment sent out a, a request to the public. I think this was in 20, also like 2014 ish, where they asked the public, help us identify foul and stinky rivers. Take a picture, geolocate it so we can fix it. Well, it ends up there, an avalanche of data came into them and they didn't know what to do. So they turned to, uh, remember my slides, Ma Jun at the, that, that, the IPE, this NGO, they partnered with him. So he has now a, I think it's called the foul and stinky river map. Um, where they, they and you know, Ma Jun's NGO with other NGOs around the country are helping to populate open, you know, access maps about where the citizen scientists, as I call them, are reporting the foul and filthy rivers, and it's helped the government to help so they can start tracking down. But Ma Jun and his team, they also follow up to make sure that action has been taken. So, you know, so they people are aware of the problem. But they are encouraged by some of the changes. The skies are getting bluer. Um, I mean, you're, you know, you go hop. Well, when last time I could hop on a taxi in China, my taxi driver would wax poetic about low carbon development. Um, so, so there is the awareness. Um, but you know, at pressuring companies, that's a little, that's a little trickier. I think that you know, because I mean, they're, you know, they are really into consumption. But, but we are seeing there are some NGOs like. Uh, China Zero Waste Alliance, Plastic Free China, that are trying to encourage people to, you know, consume less, ask for ask for less plastic. So, yeah. Thank you, and Judy. Your thoughts on this question? Yeah, I'll try to be quick because I know I want to get to a lot, but um, I'm I'm reminded of Greenpeace's detox campaign um, a while back, which was uh, a way of targeting some of the corporations that dump. Uh, toxic dye into the Yangtze River. So it was all these fast fashion. It was Zara and Burberry and so on and so forth, Nike, Adidas. And that was a campaign that was um, intended to reach the consumer and it was incredibly successful. So it reached the international consumer, also reached the Chinese consumer. And almost immediately, all of these companies changed their behavior. Um, so that's an example of how young people do pressure corporations in China. Now, this is all turned around now with the whole Xinjiang and cotton thing, right? So kind of let's keep that to one side. And I wanted to just make one more point about the young people, because um, it goes to the question of what motivates Chinese activists. And often people have in the West ha have a romantic idea that somehow Buddhism and Confucianism and Taoism are all sustainable. And, you know, we're going to go back to our sort of roots. And there are elements of sustainability in all three of those traditions. But my sense is, and of course, they will say, you know, Mao made a mistake. He said, back to that book that you were talking about earlier, Mao made a mistake. He said, Ren Ding Sheng Tian, which means man must conquer nature. And in fact, it should be Tian Ren He. There's a harmony between people in the heavens, and that's kind of more of a Confucian idea. So then they'll know that. But I think for young people, it's much more of a question of being modern and joining global civil society. So we get even a Greta Thunberg, uh, you know, wannabe, like a young girl who just basically imitating what um, international activists have done on climate. I think the motivation is much more um, uh, cosmopolitan, if you will, rather than uh, a reseeking of the roots. If I, Bob, if I can add in real quick another thing about with the public, where I think, you know, demanding cleaner and greener, I think particularly like think about the fish, like, like you don't know if you go to Chinese market if that is this an illegally caught, illegally caught fish. Um, consumers aren't necessarily demanding that right now. I mean, we have we've seen some green certifications on on other products, but um, that that's an area where you know. But and also keep in mind, it's not just the Chinese that are eating these illegally caught fish. So that that the, the fishing question, you know, it's consumers in the West as well. Um, you know. The traceability. I mean, it's not something that's impossible. I mean, China had some traceability on fish prior to the Olympics for in terms of food safety issues. Um, so yeah, so just just wanted to inject in there that it's not just the Chinese consumers, but global consumers as well. That they're, you know, you know, we we vote with our wallets in terms of like, are we going to buy this fish? Do we know where it's from? That's in the next question. Actually, segues uh, very nicely, and it has to do with blue carbon. 
and uh, the, the extent to which the, I guess the national government is looking at blue carbon as a uh, as a potential approach to dealing with um, the problems in China's China's waterways. And I, uh, Jennifer, do you want to take a stab at this or? I'm not sure what what they mean by blue carbon. Uh, are they talking about like the green like green port type issues? Uh, it would be partly that I assume the green okay, port well, initiative. I'll start. Well, I'll answer a little bit on that. But China has, um, I think it was in also like 2014, 2015. There was a day where, well, that day it was like for 40 days. There was so much smog around the port of Shanghai. They had to use satellites to to get the boats into the into the into the harbor, um, because because of the diesel that's burned on on ships. You know that. Huge amounts of, of air pollution. It's common, you know, even in like the port of LA. And in fact, Shanghai, port of Shanghai and port of LA, they've been cooperating together for for 15 years about finding ways to decrease pollution and CO2 emissions from ports. And um, I hosted one a, a researcher in China, Dr. Peng from the Ministry of Transport uh, think tank, about how he and others have how they created a green port initiative, which is requiring ships that there's a there's a certain emission zone. You know, zones coming into ports where they have to switch to cleaner fuels. When they come into the ports, they have to turn off their diesel and plug in to to the grid. And so that and and that they have actually started taking this kind of policy up the Yangtze River so that to clean up even these smaller ports. And so so that's encouraging as well. But keep in mind that when you plug in your ships or even plug in your electric vehicle, what is the energy that's powering that? So that's I mean. Electric vehicles do do a lot to, to clean up like in city air pollution issues because they're just they're not emitting it. But if the ultimate power that you're plugging into is still coal, we still have a carbon problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and on blue carbon, um, my sense is that these initiatives that Jennifer is describing are much more about um, water pollution um, than they are being used explicitly to mitigate climate change. Um, but I could be wrong. I just haven't heard that conversation. Okay. Well, the, 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 the green ports is about air pollution. It's kind of co-benefit of controlling air pollution and and um, carbon emissions. So 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 it's really encouraging. And the, the, here's the question here: China's let's let's bring BRI in because BRI is everywhere. You know, China's building ports all around the world, and so you know, as China's building these ports, why not bring? the policies and practices that they've been developing in Chinese ports to make them cleaner and greener along the Belt and Road. I tossed that out there because that, 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 that's another opportunity that, again, reduces energy demand in these countries and reduces pollution. Just saying, green BR, it could happen. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, moving on, the next question, I, I think both of you mentioned this already just in passing that the very vagueness of these policy initiatives, uh, particularly, you know, the exactly what is included in the BRI, and then this vexing thing called ecological civilization. Um, so I guess turning to Judy first, um, the person posing the question actually framed this in two ways. So this, how does it make it more difficult to study these issues from an analytical viewpoint? And then second, in terms of diplomacy, does the vagueness of these initiatives help or hurt any sort of diplomatic exchanges? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love this question. Because um, on the one hand, putting out really broad frameworks, that's just, a, that's just the way the CCP works. They've been doing this for really probably a century. I don't know, at least since the nine years, right? They make a broad framework and then the implementation gradually filters down through the ranks. And this is often really problematic because the implementation, the devil is in the details and a lot of distortion happens in the implementation um, where local officials will then use these broad frameworks to further their own um, personal goals. Um, but this is not unusual for China. Um, as far as ecological civilization, it's actually, there are actually all kinds of think tanks in China, the think tank to study ecological civilization. And um, my co-author, Ifei Li, has a really brilliant um, sort of analysis of sort of um, trying to summarize what he says. That eco they could have talked about sustainable development, but that would have been a Western import. 
Instead, they went to create a Chinese style, you know, and it's much more than just China going green or Xi Jinping is hugging a tree. It's about China's unique ideological contribution to almost like a latter stage of Marxism. It's a vision of the China civilization contribution to the planet. And in some ways, it's throwing down the gauntlet to the Beijing, the, the Washington consensus and saying, China has another vision, another way to go. It's ecological civilization. Every country can look like Shanghai and still be green. You know, this is like a whole other thing that they're doing. So, um, yeah, well, I think um, my guess is that the person who asked the question maybe was a diplomat um, asking, is it harder diplomatically or not? You know, this is classic, you know, Western Chinese um, negotiation problem, right? Because the Chinese like to have the broad frameworks and the Westerners are more legalistic and they want to know what, 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 let's write it down. And the Chinese are like, but we're friends. Let's get together for dinner tomorrow and talk about it some more. And then you sign the contract and the Chinese are still negotiating, right? So this is um, not unique at all to what we're seeing now. Um, and I would just say that if you are a diplomat, um, it behooves you to plunge deeply into Chinese culture so you can understand what's going on you know, with all of this. So. Hey, Bob, I'm going to jump back in because I had a little, my, when, you, when the, the question about blue carbon, I was like, I was like, what is that? And I realized it's, they're, they're talking about the um, mangroves and marshes and seaweed to capture. So I was like, my brain went ocean. But, and so, so that China has lost, since 1950, China has lost about 80% of their mangroves and marshes because of land reclamation. And now there have been some efforts to start, you know, there's actually a really great uh, uh, NGO, a mangrove protection group in Fujian that's been doing a lot to try to help protect mangroves. Um, and so these are meant to be like carbon sinks. So it is, it is it's both a, you know, kind of a climate mitigation and adaptation strategy. And so, I mean, we are seeing, again, part of the ecological development strategy that, that trying to protect nature. And so it's, I don't think it's the, the hugest part of their, their climate strategy yet, but it, it is something where, you know, there, there is a lot of potential in this. Sorry again, I misfired on that one earlier. Uh, and Jennifer, this is specifically for you and it's more of a, your personal subjective gut response. And it has to do what you were just speaking about, about the scope of the, uh, outside the law fishing industry now. And, um, the question really has to do with, uh, do you, do you feel that there's a potential for good faith negotiations or is this something where it's meeting such a critical food need that the Chinese government may not be able to rein in their fleet? Well, I mean, there, there's, I mean, their new fisheries law. You know, they, they put it out there that they are going to start dealing with IUU fishing. So, you know, it could take time. Um, but I, I think that, that there's there's a lot of pressure coming up. I mean, we've seen in Latin America, Ecuador and some other countries have, have created a, a, a recently a regional monitoring system. And there's a lot more interest. I think international groups are going to start kind of helping out with that as well. There's talk, too, about along the entire Pacific coast from, you know, from going from Alaska down to the tip of Latin, you know, down to the Antarctica of creating marine protected areas. Um, a little side note, China did support the creation of what's, what's now the world's largest marine protected uh, area in Antarctica, the Ross Sea uh, marine protected area a few years ago, but then they voted against last year, adding two more marine protected areas around Antarctica. Um, I mean, the same year they launched the world's largest um, Oh, wait, oh my gosh, my, where's my brain is at? Well, that, I mean, China, China, China's fishes down there as well. And so, but so it's what, what's going to be interesting to see that is as the world comes together, kind of like we're seeing with, with the climate conversation, that when, when things become multilateral, it, it can, it can pressure other bad actors. Like, well, you know, it's not just, it's not just the Chinese that are illegal fishers, but I think it, keep an eye on what's going to be happening along down in, in Latin America along the Pacific Pacific coast and then Western Africa as well. But again, it's not just the Chinese, but as, as this movement goes further, you know, they're gonna have to they're gonna have to take some action. That said, keep in mind that China also does um, they have ships that they can actually they're like floating factories that can process fish on the ocean. So let's talk about 
hiding, you know, there's no transparency in that fish come pre processed. Where they mm -hmm. come from, but yeah, but there's the eyes are out there. Uh, go ahead, Judy. Yeah, I'm a, like, I think an important but short point to make, which is that often outside observers think that the Chinese government has more control over what their investors are doing overseas than they actually do. It's complex. Some of it's state owned enterprises, some of it's private companies, some of it's, you know, rogue, you know, you can't really trace the money and the ownership of these um, very easily at all. So, um, there have been lots of efforts to try to pressure the Chinese government to get control of what's going on on the BRI and with the IUUs, but um, it's not so easy. And recently, the MEE, the Ministry of Ecology and the Environment, instituted a system for the BRI projects where they tried to say, this is green, this is good, this is like yellow, this is red. And the companies pushed back. They said, you know, who are you to tell us what to do overseas? So China is not a monolith. China is not a monolith. Say this 20 times to yourself. China's not a monolith. So what goes on in the MEE is very different from what might go on in the energy agency. It's very different what goes on in, you know, it's just like, it's very complicated. So, um, yeah, we think, oh, well, it's an authoritarian country. They can just wave their wand and this is going to happen. But it's, it's, not, it's not so easy. Thank you. And now I guess this is a, I guess a, productively controversial question and it has to do with uh, it has both a health public health impact and a conservation impact and that's i believe jennifer mentioned already their massive increase in the consumption of endangered species uh, for perceived health benefits and we know that after sars and i guess 2004 there was public talk by the chinese government of curbing the consumption um that doesn't seem appear to have happened so I guess I'll begin with Judy this time. Do you see maybe as a side effect of COVID a more concerted top-down attempt to bring this in? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I'm the person who may have mentioned it. Um, they want us to close down the wet markets. You know, in Chinese culture, um, the idea is that you want to eat the animal as close to what it was living as possible. I'm a vegetarian. This is very upsetting to me. But anyway, so they, they in a wet market, often the animal is killed in front of you. Or even in America, if you go to the seafood section of, you know, one of these big Asian markets, everything's alive, you know. Um, and so this is very um, profound part of Chinese culture. And I mean, there may be something to it. I don't know. So, but after SARS, which was also a zoonotic disease problem, the, many of the wet markets were shut down, but then they opened up again. And um, so I think um, Jennifer may know this better than I, but I believe that groups like Friends of Nature and some of the other NGOs really pushed to strengthen the wildlife protection laws. And there was some success there. There was a new wildlife law passed. Um, but then there's always these loopholes, right? What about the people in remote areas who rely on hunting in order to feed their families and so on and so forth? So to what extent you can somehow wean an entire 1.4 billion people off of um, eating wildlife when it goes to their national identity in some ways? I mean, in, about the people of Guangzhou, they always say, they boast, we'll eat every we'll eat anything on four legs that isn't a table, they always say, you know, very adventuresome sort of gastronomic uh, practices. I don't know, um, but it's really critical. I mean, for animal welfare and for uh, public health and um, yeah, it's critical. And for, of course, the pressure on endangered species, we didn't even start, you know, the pangolins and the elephants and the turtles and so on and so forth, yeah. There, there has been there, there has been some progress in some of these areas, like the International Fund for Animal Welfare has been based in China for for they have an office in China, and they've been doing a lot of work with policymakers, but also notably the traditional Chinese medicine associations, because and and we have seen in some areas like like with the bear claw for example or bear bile and tiger claw, where, you know the the, the people the traditional Chinese medicine folks are actually making it have agreed to step away. I think bare bile, I don't think they're doing that anymore. You know, so, so it's like there, there's, there, and that, that's, that's something, you know, similar to when I was talking about the fish, is that, you know, there has to be the people who are consuming, and in this case, 
the people who are making the final product that goes to the consumers. Um, but yeah, it's it's it, it's a tough problem. But I think that but um, wait and see because I think that we're we're going to. I don't. Yeah, fourteen five year plan didn't have wasn't really that explicit on on the whole wildlife issue. But I think that there's still there's going to be more international pressure on this. There's a lot of international campaigns. Um, you know, not just Yao Ming, even though he's still a big guy on this. You know, when when the consuming stops, the killing stops is basically the tagline for a lot of these groups. So it's you know, stay tuned. I mean, they're not shark shark fin soup. Can't get that. Any, you, it's harder to get that now in China. So that you, there are some victories that are being that are being, you know, brought brought in by a lot of the, a lot of this was NGO campaigning. Sustainability, particularly in the context of a uh, core aspect of this is the export of say coal plants. Right, or areas part of it. So do you, uh, do you see the belt and road initiative as. Potentially including some component of sort of an export of China's green development model. And I guess yeah. I start with Jennifer, because you mentioned the BRI, right? And, and I said, it's. It, it's tough, but that but Xi Jinping has stated, you know, even today, even this morning, he, he mentioned, you know, greening the BRI. Um, it is still going to be tough because a lot of it is that it, it's the, the, the importing countries, they will often say, we want coal. Um, and I think it was under, you know, we used to build coal fired power plants in other countries as well. I believe uh, former President Obama stopped that. Um, the Japanese have now said that they're not going to build coal-fired power plants overseas, and the Koreans are being also nudged that direction. So, I mean, that this is, it's it's interesting times that we're going to have this, you know, we have everybody declaring carbon neutrality pledges, talks about, you know, and China declaring that they're going to help the developing world on a more sustainable path. So there's there's a lot of pressure. There's, there's also questions, too, about whether, you know, besides the, the, the carbon emissions, there's also, you know, think of coal fired power plants are also very, it's a very thirsty form of technology. And so you have examples like in Zimbabwe where there's a plant that the Chinese are building and needed, they're not building the air cooled plants, which are much more efficient and use less water. They're, you know, I don't know if the, you know, the Chinese are exporting some of their older technology. Again, it's, it's, they had it, they have the people who can run it. It's a jobs, you know, kind of, kind of campaign. And so now, because they need water, the, the Sino Hydro is helping to build a water transfer project from southern Zimbabwe that's actually taking water out of an international watershed, which I, I won't even go down to whether the, the legality of that. But so, so, the, so there's the there's the pollution, the CO2, and the water foot, footprint of coal. And so it's you know there's there's a lot of arguments to be made that 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 really isn't the solution. But yeah, it's just it, I think it, we're gonna again in the next. You know, in the next couple of years, you know, we might be seeing more pressure coming onto China, but there has to be help to get electricity and power to these nations that need it. Again, 33% of Pakistan doesn't have electricity. Yeah, and, and my concern about the greening the Belt and Road is that um, there tends to be a very carbon focused understanding of what greening is. And um, so often, well, actually, I heard a speech this morning from one of the um, heads of state saying, you know, we have we're carbon negative because we have all of our all of our energy comes from dams and hydropower dams are problematic in their own way. Right. They're problematic because of their disruption of ecosystems of their all the forcible reloc relocations involved. And so a lot of these Belt and Road projects. Um, involve um, cutting up or fragmenting habitat, um, slicing through rainforests, blocking river systems, and those have very immediate effects on biodiversity as well. And I think that that gets lost sometimes in the conversation when it's just about carbon. And the focus on carbon tends to feed that sort of technocratic mindset, you know? Um, so, but uh, China is under a lot of pressure. Um, because of the, the essentially the hypocrisy involved in, um, you know, d being so green at home and then exporting all of its coal um, technologies. Yeah, um, and the next question is, I guess, more 
uh, a politics and public perception question. It has to do with the extent to which everyday people are buying into these micro level campaigns um, and the questioner uh, provides examples such as the single use chopstick campaign, the ban on plastics, um, neighborhood and recycling. Um, and I would add to that, do you see a sharp divide between rural and urban areas in, in public, both buying and, and, and response to these campaigns? And I, I guess, again, we'll start with Judy and then go to Jennifer. Okay. Well, I'm just drawing on what my co-author had to say about the Shanghai recycling campaign. Apparently they rolled it out for the people he knew very poorly um, and got people really mad. And it was very confusing because of the ways that people were supposed to categorize things. Now, somebody else I knew who was in Shanghai during the rollout said, oh, they worked so hard. There were so many public information campaigns, et cetera, et cetera. And the reason they could only allow people to recycle for two, four hours a day, two hours in the morning and two hours at night, is they had to have little old ladies there to inspect the trash and the little old ladies weren't free all day. And that's why it was so inconvenient for people. And so eventually she said, people were able to send their IEs out to do the recycling, so it's okay. So, I mean, I don't know what the truth of that is, but generally speaking, what we find over and over again is that when there is public support for these, they'll work. And if there's no public support, then not only do they not work in the long run, but they actually could be um, undermined almost deliberately. Like we have images of the Shanghai recycling, like people would take it to work and throw it out the, the bus window instead because they couldn't, you know, they couldn't comply. So um, yeah, um, on the other hand, you know, when I was doing my Mao's War book and I talked to young people throughout China towards the end of it, I found that they had such deep green um, understandings of the human place in nature and we're, you know, we're harming our mother earth and, you know, just such, you know, deep feelings about the earth. And so I think that if it's not seen as some kind of imposed coercive state down arbitrary quantitative target based um, sort of corruption based uh, sort of an initiative, but rather if the people can be heard in the crafting of these initiatives, then they can work. Yeah, Judith, I want, when, when you, when Judith, when you came and spoke at my, the center, you know, a little while after you did your book, and I was really struck with how you, you had commented too, that, you know, kind of how, you know, Chinese NGOs, maybe their space has been less, and that's actually a big loss for the government, because again, the NGOs, also can help be a voice, also could be an education tool. And um, yeah, but then, but, you know, but top down, you know, it, it can work. I mean, well, first of all, if you have bands, like real bands, when people die, because you don't have the plastic to, to, to actually, you know, to, to create waste from. Um, but th there is a lot of experiment. What is nice, what's interesting to see in the plastic realm, there is in the private sector, there's a lot of experimentation. Because again, while there are no, regulations, for example, on e-commerce yet. I mean, they're, they're just telling the e-commerce companies they have to um, they have to provide data how much plastic waste they're producing. So that's like the first step, you know, like jaws, da, 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 right? The government, they want to regulate you. So like any good business, they're trying to come up with solutions. And, and there's a lot of experimentation with everything from setting up these machines. So it's kind of like a reverse, you know, thing of, you don't go there to get a soda, you actually go in and you you put your packaging in there and you might get some credit for it. Like it, it's like, like we have money on your, on your WeChat account on your phone, or you just feel good that you've recycled it. Um, and, and even at, like on university campuses, that like if, if they're bowls that are reusable, there's different places where you could put them in the machine again. So there's, I mean, I, I mean, what I do like is that, that, that when, when you see the private sector in China getting in on the act and then it, it's exciting, but then I worry that sometimes the government will just say, we'll do that. Right, instead of allowing for this kind of, you know, very this glorious kind of variation in the ecosystem that could help solve the problem. Yeah, I mean, just to add to that, um, this longing for a green dictator problem. Um, <laughs> people used to talk about Chairman Mao, and they would say, "Well, what if the dictator is wrong? You know, what if the dictator is wrong?" And that's the problem with this um, sort of coercive approach. I think. And that's perfect for the next question. Um, and I guess we're beginning with Judy. Um, we all know that in the last 
30 years or so, there have been massive inputs by the Chinese government at different levels into both conservation and preservation projects. Um, and both have involved to some extent limits on people's property rights and or widespread displacement. Um, and two examples would be the grasslands project out west with uh, nomads and then in sort of the interior of China, the practical problem of constructing national parks in a territory that's been inhabited for 3,000 years. You move it. So could you, Judy, comment on this? This yeah. it, Within China, is this controversial? Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for bringing this up because this is really critical and, and it is part of the work that I've been doing lately. In China, they call it ecological migration ecological migration. And it was one of the reasons I wanted to do this latest book, uh, China Goes Green, because I'm, as, a, as somebody who cares about the environment and as somebody who cares about human rights, very deeply offended by the idea that you forcibly, you force nomads off of lands that they've um, inhabited for, you know, their entire ethnic identity. And, you know, you've said you've done them a big favor by shoving them into towns and giving them a flush toilet and a couple of bucks. And this is um, devastating. And so on the one hand, you know, it's exciting that they're making these national parks bigger than Yellowstone and a half and all of that. But there's a lot of anxiety among the people who live in these, um, this Tibetan, this plateau area, um, the uh, Sanjiangyuan, uh, it's called Sanjiangyuan, um, because right now they're kind of letting some of the people stay and making, each family has some kind of representative to help carry out the goal of, you know, creating this protected area, but they don't know, you know, how long are we going to be allowed to stay and will we be forcibly moved out? And I've visited some parks in like northern Yunnan where in the past people were allowed to live inside. They were inside the park and they built the park and they made them move. And in the past they had allowed tourists to stay with them and they got a little money that way or had pony rides, they got a little money that way. And now it's fortress conservation. You know, this is a term we use, fortress conservation, like they ha we have in Yellowstone and Yosemite, where, you know, um, it's like, this is where the park begins and ends. So it's a great concern. And um, it goes to, I think, the Chinese state's efforts to pacify the borderlands, which has been on the agenda for centuries. They James Scott said, states don't like nomads, right? And so, you know, the Chinese state is delighted to have this environmental excuse to finally make the nomads sit down, you know, be counted, be taxed, um, you know, do all the things that states like to do. Um, so, yeah, no, thanks very much um, for raising this question. In our book, we call it green grabbing. Green grabbing is a kind of a phrase. Yeah. Jennifer? The last meeting back number of year, March 2020, I had a meeting with people in the room and it was about U.S.-China cooperation on national parks. And it was, uh, it, was it was really, it was really exciting to, to learn about that. This has also been an area that, that it, you know, the, the, the two countries have been working together on. And, 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 and one of the stories that, that uh, my speaker from um, Park Service, you know, that, that he talked about, Rudy was saying that the question about whether or not those Tibetans could stay. Now, China's created a national park system, but they don't have national park rangers, right? So the people, the Tibetans who are who are basically acting as as park rangers, they're not part of a formal system, as you as you said, Judith. But the uh, but when the, when the Chinese years ago were brought to the states, um, the U.S. side made sure to share stories about what we did. To, why did we have Yellowstone and all these parks? We kicked out the Native American peoples there as well, and. And and so it's been a big part of it was a, has been a big part of the conversation as China sets up Sanjiangyuan. Like for example, the, he he shared a side of these pictures of you know the the Tibetans are raising yak and there's yak running along the mountain. This beautiful photo and the Chinese say no 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 this is not good this is nature and the, and the guys are like it's what nature is now. The nomads you know they're moving the yaks around. It, it it's it's part of the actual ecological system here, and they they were saying that this adds to the parks attraction to have these yaks so it's a, but it's a, there is a big question mark like will these people will they, if if they can become part of a true national park ranger system that would be that would, i mean it's not going to help all the people that maybe were pushed off but for some of the people to stay and to play that role i mean it adds such a richness to the whole park experience 
Right, we have exactly four minutes, so the la I'm going to conflate a bunch of questions together and give you the most difficult one. And you each got two minutes. And it's, um, given that former Senator Kerry is in Beijing talking specifically about environmental issues, um, and we didn't want to talk about other issues with the China-U.S. relationship, but obviously they're there. We're all in Washington, so there's Xinjiang and Hong Kong and Tibet and trade relations and tariffs in your gut view do you is it feasible to think the current administration can withstand a lot of u.s domestic pressure to address all these other things rather than say focusing on climate change and these pressing global environmental issues with china i guess we begin with jennifer well as i mentioned before that i mean this is, we've done this in the past. And I mean, but in the past, climate and environment, they were, they were, I mean, under the Obama administration, it became an anchor of the relationship. And, and also, again, it's not just gov to gov, a lot of US NGOs, think tanks, universities, foundations engaging with China on these issues as well. Um, to, and, and so I, I don't think that, you know, it's not, again, probably going to become an anchor of our relationship. It still could be, you know, it's, a, it's an avenue of, you know, keeping communication going, um, as 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 Judith mentioned, kind of you know, like you know, environmental peacemaking or science diplomacy, whatever you want to call it, and that and that 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 can be important. But it's a, but I think that what maybe takes some of the pressure off this is that you know, that it it could very well become much more of a multilateral kind of conversation that other countries will be putting pressure on China as well in terms of the climate and other issues. And, you know, and Biden needs to focus a lot domestically, you know, I mean, it's great. I mean, the, I believe, you know, the, 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 the leader summit that's going on and, you know, Biden has to, you know, show that he can walk the walk, talk the talk. Luckily, a lot of states and cities in the U.S. have kind of kept the climate climate action going over the past four years. Um, but yes, I mean, I mean, there's, there's a lot of balls in the air and, um, Again, you know, like Scott Tong said, you know, we can argue and chew gum that, you know, that, that the relationship can still kind of move forward. But, but clearly, you know, there's, it's not that, uh, and even it was even said, Kara said early on, we're not going to trade things like saying, like, well, we give you climate, you know, you, you do climate, and then we're going to give you a pass on these other issues. Climate is a standalone, it's, it's a global threat. That's Thank all, you. And that's the line from the administration. I'm just, just, to, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not in the administration, but this is what, how it's been. Um, kind of couched and it's the tough, tough line to walk. And Judy, you get the last word. Okay, but it's going to be short. I was saying U.S.-China relations are in a really tricky moment, and it's not just because of this list of issues. It's because the U.S. was a superpower and China was a weak country, and now China is a strong country and the U.S. is in decline, and that's a very tricky moment. And we need people on both sides to really try to understand each other and not to forgive each other or give each other a pass, as Jennifer said, but to keep the conversation going, keep the dialogue go going, because the world needs these two superpowers to cooperate on a whole range of issues. Yeah. I want to, on behalf of the Seeger Center, I want to thank both Dr. Shapiro and Dr. Turner for taking time out to join us today. And thank you all for attending this virtual event. Um, if you're interested in further Seeger Center events, just Google us, uh, Seeger Center for Asian Studies, DWU. Um, we have an awesome webpage. And um, again, thank you very much. And hopefully we'll see you all again. Happy Earth Day, happy Earth Day. <laughs>